Good morning and welcome to worship. Um, just a quick word of uh, uh, preparation here. Sometimes we range all over the scriptures. We'll have 20 different verses. And if you have your Bible open, it's very difficult to listen and to flip to 20 different places. Uh, I'm guilty of that, but today won't be like that, at least not as much. And so um, we're going to be in Psalm 2. You can safely and confidently open to Psalm 2 and know that you won't need to flip a bunch of pages. But that also means, because we're used to putting the slides up, and, and we will, it also means that if you don't have a Bible, I uh, would like to give you one. So we've got a stack of them back there. If you don't have a copy of the Word of God with you and you would like one, raise your hand, we'll get you one, and they're yours to keep if you want as a gift from us. Um, like many of you, I've read all of the Psalms over the years, and I've got my favorites, I've got the ones that I particularly like, and some of them match a particular mood, a particular season in life. Um, I have go-to Psalms for various situations. But until recently, I've not spent a lot of time, to be honest with you, studying the structure of the book of Psalms as a whole. We, we, we sort of treat it like a cafeteria, like they just threw some food out here, some songs out there, and I'm a little hungry for this or a little hungry for that, and don't actually notice that there's a structure to the book, that somebody put these together, they put them in an order, they gave us an introduction, which is Psalms 1 and 2. Uh, Bob preached from Psalm 1 last week, I'm going to preach from Psalm 2 this week, and it's widely recognized that together they form an introduction. When you get to the end of the psalm, Psalm 146 through 50, widely recognized to be the conclusion. Um, it's just praise after praise after praise. And in between, you've got all manner of psalms divided into five books. It's recognized there's five books there, um, uh, five sections. They have a theme. They've got things that, that identify them. They end in more or less the same way. So there is a structure Somebody, we believe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they didn't just write the Psalms, because there, there's ten authors, they're written over about a thousand years, but somebody also put them together, put them in these, this order, these books, etc., and it's actually worthwhile and beneficial to look at it. So that's one of the goals of this series. We think there's good and helpful things to be discovered, not just by reading your favorite Psalm, but by looking at the book as a whole and saying, why is it the way it is? I think there's things that will build your faith. I think there's things that will direct your daily life um, if we keep in mind the structure that's put before us. So let's pray before we go into this work. Father God, it's in Psalms that we're told that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It's in Psalms that we read, open our eyes, Lord, that we might behold wonderful things from your word and so that's our prayer your word is a light it is a lamp it is wonderful and we need eyes that are opened would you graciously do that for us today we pray in jesus name amen i want to begin the study uh, with an insight that i got from dr moeller uh, he's president of southern baptist theological seminary um Three of us just got back from the um, together for the gospel conference, and they gave out a copy of his new study Bible, Grace and Truth Study Bible. And if you turn to the introduction to Psalms, he said something that I found both true and helpful. He said, The psalmist tends to face east, waiting not only for the dawn of a new day, but for the dawn of a new age. I find that helpful. Because sometimes we dive into the Psalms and we are just looking for help for today. Today's been a good day and we want to celebrate. Today's a hard day and we want to mourn and we want comfort. And we don't often step back and say, there's help for today, but there's a vision for the future. It's not just a new day that we need. It's a new age that we need. I think Dr. Moeller is right. The Psalms are not just about the here and now. We often treat them that way, but they're also about what we should hope for in the long term. We should be looking further down the road to a better age. Last week, Bob started us in Psalm 1, and the blessing that was to be found in meditating on God's law. Do you want to live a happy and a blessed life? Well, then you should meditate 
day and night on the law of the Lord. It's going to make you like that tree planted by streams of water. Drought doesn't affect it. Its roots are going down deep. It always produces fruit in season. Its leaf doesn't wither. And in everything a man like that does, it says he prospers. It's a good image of a happy way to live. Well, if Psalm 1 heralds the blessing of submitting gladly to God's word, Psalm 2 then builds on that and heralds the blessedness of submitting gladly to God's rule, to God's king. There is a king, there is a ruler, there is an anointed one who shows up in Psalm 2 uh, and is, in fact, the focus of it. And it's interesting, I, I, I saw this the other day, and I thought, this, I think this is right, I think this is good. Isn't it interesting that in the person of Jesus Christ, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 come together? In Jesus Christ, you have God's word, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And in Psalm 2, you've got the Son of God. He shows up in Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. He shows up as the word in Psalm 1. He shows up as the king in Psalm 2. And if you were to say that the introduction to the Psalms is in some ways an introduction to Jesus Christ, you'd be right. He is the Word, and He is the King. I point that out because you know there's many who want to uh, pull things from the Word of God, uh, who see wisdom, uh, good governance, a lot of things they agree with in the Bible, but they're not overly interested in acknowledging Jesus as King. They want to separate out what Psalm 1 and 2 put together. He is the Word, and He is the King. There's a great example of this in an interview I stumbled across. Um, uh, it was conducted with Elon Musk, founder of Tesla, and he's probably one of the most innovative men um, in this century. And he was being interviewed, of all periodicals, by the Babylon Bee. Uh, if you know what that is, it's a very satirical um, Christian, uh, probably just online, I don't know that they print anything, um, but they're very tongue-in-cheek little sarcastic, very funny, very clever. Um, but they did a mostly serious interview with this really influential and interesting man. And I want to read you just a short excerpt from that interview. In the podcast, creative director Ethan Nicole did ask, to make this church, we're wondering if you could do us a quick solid and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's what he said to Elon Musk. After an awkward pause, some laughter, Musk took the question seriously. Quote, there's great wisdom in the teachings of Jesus, and I agree with those teachings. Things like turn the other cheek are very important, as opposed to an eye for an eye. An eye for an eye leaves everyone blind, said Musk, paraphrasing a quote attributed to Mahatma Gandhi. Musk also quoted Albert Einstein, affirming belief in the God of Spinoza, in which the material universe is seen as an expression of God? He continues, Forgiveness, you know, is important. And treating people as you would wish to be treated, added Musk, love thy neighbor as thyself, very important. But hey, if Jesus is saving people, I won't stand in his way. Sure, I'll be saved. Why not? I doubt that that was the moment of salvation for Elon. I pray that it would be, but I think that day is still future. But it's not uncommon for someone to say, oh, I, I love some of the things Jesus said. I, I have a Bible. I read it. I, I memorize some of it because there's good stuff in here. They're glad, they're happy to live in Psalm 1, meditating on the Word of God and saying, that's important and that's good. But now you bring them into Psalm 2. And you say, there's a king. You know what you do before kings? You bow. You obey. You worship. You serve. And suddenly the interest gets a little bit more lukewarm. Jesus speaks to that problem when he says in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me, Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? I mean, oh, and I got a little out of my own order here. We all know the people that say, I love the word of God. I'm just not so sure about the king. But the other problem does exist. And Jesus says, you treat me as, or you, you call me king, you call me Lord, but then you don't do what I say. 
you don't get to live in Psalm 1 and not 2, and you don't get to live in Psalm 2 and not 1, because Jesus is Lord of both those psalms. He is the Word, and He is the King. And when you take them together, they spell out, what does it look like to live a happy life, to live a blessed life? In fact, as Bob pointed out last week, Psalm 1 begins with a word about how to live blessed. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Guess how Psalm 2 ends? How blessed is the man who takes refuge in the king. Book ends. It's like two pillars. If you want to enter the Psalms rightly, you enter them knowing that it's blessed to meditate on his word and it's blessed to take refuge in the king. You would enter the Psalms that way and I would argue the scriptures as well. Well, Psalm 2's got a very clear structure. It's not hard to see. It's a song, all Psalms are, four stanzas. Each stanza has three verses. What is somewhat unique is that in each stanza, a different person is speaking. In the first stanza, it's the nations, the rulers, the people, it's you and I speaking. In the second stanza, it's God the Father who speaks. In the third stanza, it's God the Son. And it's not until you get to the fourth stanza that the psalmist actually speaks. Um, we're not told who the author of these introductory psalms is, at least in the Old Testament. A lot of psalms have a superscription, and they say this is a psalm of Asaph or David, and they might even give a situation. Um, this is a psalm of David when he feigned insanity before the Philistines to save his own life. So you get some historical background. If you go to Acts 4.25... When the people are praying, they, they quote, Why do the nations rage in vain, which is the first um, verse in this psalm, and they say that's a psalm of David. So we can say David wrote it, but it doesn't tell us here. Why? Why doesn't it tell us who wrote this psalm if, if the knowledge is out there? And I want to I suggest you a reason that, I, that I've found compelling. If we knew it was David's psalm, and we knew kind of where it was in his life, we might go in... To, to the historical accounts and, and see, oh, okay, this is what was going on with David. This was the battle he was fighting. This is who was giving him a hard time. And, uh, and therefore, the psalm is written in light of that. And we would anchor the psalm in history. This is one of those psalms that I don't think is supposed to be anchored in history because this is timeless. This is universal. Um, th this is not a problem that just existed for David. This is a problem that's been here from the beginning of time and is still with us. Every age, every people, every situation. It's not about David and how he solved a problem. It's about Christ and how he's going to solve a problem. I think you'll see that as we progress through the psalm. So let's begin. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. That's a description not of a particular people. That's a description of people. We do not like discovering that there's some authority above us especially an absolute authority like a creator God, at least the natural man does not. We see it in the garden. The garden is just a great example, and we inherited that sin. Adam and Eve were told, eat freely. God has created for them a wonderful home, abundant food, eat freely. One restriction, don't eat from that tree. That's it. I wish I only had one command. I might stay out of trouble. They had one command. They had no culture. There was no economic oppression. There was no racism, no sexism. There, there, was, there was nothing to get in their way. But it was so easy for Satan to say, you know something? He's trying to keep you under bondage. He's trying to keep you from realizing your full potential. And what was given as a word of life from God is taken by Adam and Eve, our parents, as bondage, restriction, 
so a cord to be cast aside so I can be me. We see this in Pharaoh as he stiffens his neck and hardens his heart against God. He will have no one rule over him. Exodus 5, 2, but Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. In other words, I think he's saying, even if Pharaoh did know God, doesn't care. He's not letting anybody go. God's not God. Pharaoh is God. And no one will tell Pharaoh what to do. There will be no boundaries for this man. Anybody tries to shackle Pharaoh with the word of God, he will, he will cast that bondage aside. He will cut those cords. That spirit lives in all of us, I believe. And we see the same rebellion in our day. We write songs to celebrate it. If you're old enough, you remember Frank Sinatra. What's his most famous song? I did it my way. Nobody told me what to do. I told me what to do. No bondage, no cords. I did it my way. About a hundred years before Sinatra, the poet William Henley wrote the poem Invictus. And I mention this with apologies to the Exodus class. You've heard this, but I think it's a, an appropriate um, illustration for Psalm 2. Uh, you know the poem, whether you realize it or not. You probably don't know all the verses, but you'll know this final verse. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. In other words, I don't care what the end of this road is, how many punishments there are. I'm going ahead. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. The poet's not interested in submitting to anyone either. And if you want to bring it just right exactly into our day, and I don't want to pour gas on a fire that already burns plenty hot, but we all know at least some of the current signs of this total rejection of God's law and God's king that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 warn us of. For example, God said in Genesis 1 that he would make man in his image, and he did so. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I hope you see glory in that verse. But do you understand that you live in a culture that sees bondage in that verse? They don't celebrate male and female. They reject the idea that gender is even really a reality. God has no business telling me whether I'm male or female. That limits my ability to express my true self. You've heard it. The unavoidable implications of biology and chromosomes are seen as cords to be cut and the bondage to be broken. And it's not going to work long term. I, I, I'm not... If, if this insanity lasts another 20 or 30 years without some restrictions, I'll be surprised because already... Biological males are declaring themselves to be female, to be transgender, and then competing in sports. They were very mediocre as a male, and now they're setting world records pretending to be a female. Um, I read today that a, um, a criminal uh, who's about to go to jail declared himself to be transgender, to be female, so he would be housed in the women's prison. It will surprise none of you that he raped one of the women. Who didn't see that coming? It's not going to work. Gender is perhaps the ultimate expression of the creature trying to shake his fist at the creator. You will not tell me who I am or what I must do, even if every bit of science and biology says, oh, yes, he will. We see this rebellion against God in the field of labor. This, this surprised me here. God designed us to be creative. He designed us to work. Work is not part of the curse. Work existed before the fall. And the Apostle Paul knows this. He wrote in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. That good command of God has been turned on, turned on its head. So now, because some are not willing to work, I don't get to eat. 
You know what I'm talking about. You go to a restaurant and you go, oh good, there's 10 open tables. And then you find out there's a 45 minute wait because nobody wants to come to work to serve you. Work is gone from being a gift of God where you get to image forth God by being creative and taking chaos and making order to just something we're not interested. When's my next check coming? Add to this what's happening in the Ukraine. Insanity. And the fact that world history is a history of men killing one another in war after war after war. And you'll understand why a Russian writer by the name of Alexander Herzen said this. History is the autobiography of a madman. That's true. It is. And that's what's being taught in Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3. It's mad. It's vain. It's little more than pointless raging against reality to oppose God and to oppose his anointed. It's not going to work. But people not only do it, they meditate on how to do it. You see the word plot in verse 1 of Psalm 2? It's the same word as meditate in Psalm 1. The righteous man meditates on the law of God because in it he finds delight. The wicked man meditates on how to get rid of the law of God because in it he finds bondage. So how are we to respond to just his first stanza? This was the world of the psalmist. It's our world. It's a timeless, universal problem. Let me tell you how not to respond first. Don't respond by grumbling. And and I've got to say that because I know my own tendency and I've been around enough of you to know your tendency. We get together and what do we say? Hey, did you see? And we give the next outrageous thing that we saw on the news. Did you see a Supreme Court justice confirmed who is a woman but will not define what a woman is? Did you see that? Crazy. How many of you have seen the progressive insurance commercials that don't turn into your parents' commercials? Have you seen that? They're hilarious, and they are creative. And there's one that speaks to us, I think. Dr. Rick is a life coach, and he's taking a bunch of like 30 and 40-year-olds and walking them through different situations in life and helping them not turn into their parents. You shouldn't have 12 pillows on the couch so no one can sit there. That's one of them. But there's one where he takes them into what looks like a Home Depot, that kind of store. And he's in the middle, and he's got one of his students on either side, and a young man walks by with bright blue hair. Dr. Rick says quietly under his voice, we all see it, we all see it, with the goal of getting them not to say anything. But one man cannot contain himself, and he goes, he's got blue hair. Yeah, we all see it. Don't be that guy. We live in, he's not the hero, he's the butt of the joke. Folks, we all see it. To use blue hair just as a metaphor, because I don't care about blue hair, orange hair, green hair, anything like that. I care about the heart and the soul. But, But we live in a culture of blue hair. There's odd things going on. We all see it. You're not the hero by saying, did you see it, did you see it, did you see it? We want to live in Psalm 1, I'm sorry, in in stanza 1. Not a good place to live. So don't grumble. If, if, If you live in those first three verses, you will grumble. Don't fret. Psalm 37, 1, do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious towards wrongdoers. Because fretting, anxiety says things are out of control. They're not out of control. This psalm is a psalm about God who is in control. Always has been. Always will be. We honor him by not fretting, by not wringing our hands. And don't be hopeless. We're only three verses into the psalm. There's more coming. The first three verses are dark. They're discouraging. They're universal. They're the problem but they're not all that's there. So how should we respond? Well, let's take our cues 
from God's response. He's not grumbling. He's not fretting. He's not hopeless. He doesn't have a 24-hour news feed of doom and gloom on the TV that he does not own. Rather, verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. When the Lord laughs here, it's not primarily because he finds this funny. Human rebellion is not funny. He laughs because he finds human rebellion absurd. This is like the two-year-old. We've all seen it. Maybe it was one of our kids. Maybe it's one of the grandkids. Maybe it's just somebody that you know. We've all watched as a two-year-old has a meltdown. Now think about it for a minute. The two-year-old, they can't change their own diaper, folks. They're not wise. They're not educated. They're about three feet tall. They weigh about 35, 40 pounds, and they think they should run the world. And the world doesn't cooperate. They're on the floor kicking and screaming. It's sin, showing up at a very early age. Tell me you haven't smiled a little bit. Because it's absolutely futile. Like they're going to rule over mom and dad. And yes, I know there's moms and dads that let them rule. That's a mistake. That's another message. They're not potty trained. They can't dress themselves. They can't hold a job. But they have the answers. We laugh. We're like that before God. And once God is done laughing, then he speaks. He won't be amused for long. And the kings and rulers of the earth will discover that he never really was amused. It's a terrifying thing to have God speak to you when you have been so wrong for so long. You've spent your life saying, I don't want the king. I don't want a king. He's not really there. I don't like his word. I'm going to meditate how to get rid of all this influence over my life and then find out, oh my goodness, there is a king. He's real. And I have to deal with him. It is a terrifying moment. Jesus tells a, um, a parable in Luke 19. It's about a man who is going to go on a journey, a king, and, uh, and he gives some money to his servants, and we know that portion of it, that, uh, that some of them spend it well, some of it not so well. But it also says early in that parable that some of the citizens said, we do not want this man to rule over us. As the parable starts to draw to a close, and Jesus deals with all those and their, their, their investment and what they did with the talent and opportunity, he gave them, we read this, but these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. That's why they're terrified. You say, I don't want that man to be king, and all of a sudden you find out that man is king. David Mathis is the executive editor at Desiring God. He makes, I think, a wonderful comment on this verse. He says, quote, How horrible... And wonderful it is when God laughs out loud. His laughter isn't just side-splitting, it's world-splitting. His enemies cower in fear, his friends rise in comfort. His laughter warns cosmic traitors of their impending doom while reminding weak saints that their best is yet to come. Brothers and sisters, I want to beg you, I mean, I want to beg you. Don't just live in stanza one where the God-denying rebellion of man is the dominant theme because if you did, you're going to become a miserable person. It's not the theme of the psalm. It's not the theme of the psalter. It's not the theme of the Bible. It's just background for the judgment of God and for the mercy of God. You need to know it's true. But if you live there, you will become that grumbling, unhappy person. You'll be depressed. You'll be useful to no one. No one who needs to be encouraged in their faith or rescued from sin will be drawn to you as you complain about the world. The world has blue hair. 
We all see it. Let them see that you found something better. Let them see joy and hope and worship. That doesn't mean we don't care about the rejection of God. It doesn't mean we don't care about where society is going, but we care in a different way. We want God to be glorified, and we want his creatures to flourish. It's a different kind of caring. He is telling us, don't fret. Your God reigns. He finds the rebellion of his creatures absurd and mildly amusing. That's the second stanza of the psalm. Now the third stanza. This is where the king, the anointed one that was mentioned in stanzas one and two, now speaks. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Stanza 2, kind of read as though God's king is already enthroned on his holy hill, Zion. It's like, okay, if he's there, why are the people still doing what they're doing? Well, stanza three kind of solves that for us because it takes on more of a future tense. You shall break them with a rod of iron is a future reality. And it explains why the nations are still raging and plotting. It hasn't happened yet. Because once verse nine actually happens, there will be no more raging and plotting. The judge of all the earth will set things right. So many of the psalms, and this is why the introduction and the structure is important, so many of the psalms have this dual flavor. On the one hand, the reign of God's anointed is so certain it can be spoken of as though it's happened. On the other hand, the psalmist knows that much of what we long for is still future. It hasn't happened yet. We have that already not yet that many of us are familiar with. But why hasn't it happened yet? What's, what's keeping it from happening? Don't we pray, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus? And he hasn't come. I want to suggest from a couple different places, the first of them, verse 8, is because the Son has not yet asked. When, when the Son asks the Father for something, the answer is yes. Do you not think that I could cry out to my Father right now and he would send legions of angels? He would. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Well, why hasn't he asked? Why is this rain that we long for not already here? The psalm will answer that. But first I want to let Peter answer it. We'll probably be more familiar with this. Second Peter 3.8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. According to Peter, Christ has not returned in glory to rule over all the nations for one reason. Not done saving people. He's patient. His work of ruling will not commence until his work of saving is complete. And that's where we come in. We are to join the psalmist in singing to the world the truths of the fourth and the final stanza of Psalm 2. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him so good the rebellion that was stanza one that's so wicked and the judgment that's spoken of in stanza two and stanza three seems so absolutely certain these people are going to be judged they deserve to be judged the nations the peoples the rulers the kings it's over it's not that judgment will come one day 
But until it does, we have a word for those nations and those peoples. There's hope. Be wise. Be wise. Be warned. Serve the Lord with, with fear. Unless we think that this is a call to some sort of resentful, terrified submission because we really don't want him as king. We recognize we're not going to get our way and so we'll just grit our teeth and yeah, we'll serve him. No, not that kind of service. The psalmist goes on. Rejoice. Rejoice with trembling. There's trembling, but there's joy. The, the kind of fear that's in view is not the kind of fear that kills joy. It's the kind of fear that fuels joy. Imagine coming to grips with the fact that there is an all-powerful king, one that you've either ignored or resented your whole life, he has the right to smash you to pieces like somebody could take a rod of iron and just smash a clay pot. But he doesn't do that. He offers you refuge at the cost of his own life. He offers you joy. He offers you relationship and peace and protection. And it doesn't just offer, he calls and he commands because the gospel is not primarily an invitation. It's a call to worship the king. You should tremble that there is such a king. But you should tremble with joy because he's so good. The psalmist goes on, kiss the son. What a great image. Don't just give him a nod as a good teacher, as a moral man. If, 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 if I could have five minutes with Elon Musk, I would want to say, I love what you said about God's word. Will you kiss the son? Will you embrace him for what he is, the Lord's son, his anointed, his king? Engage your heart in worship of him because he's the reason and the only reason that there's any hope. And as I mentioned earlier, the psalm ends, Psalm 2 ends the way Psalm 1 began, with blessing. Blessed are all all who take refuge in him. Now, I didn't miss the middle of verse 12. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way, kiss him, kiss the son, make peace with the son, honor the son, or he will be angry. The offer of amnesty so good. The offer of refuge made to a rebel is so good and so undeserved that to scorn it rightly provokes wrath. I've said before that the reason unbelief is so serious is because the Jesus you refuse to believe in is so good. He secures mercy for rebels at the cost of his life and he gives you a promise of joy when you finally surrender. It's a good offer, folks. Every person should take it while it's still on the table. Jeremy Taylor, Taylor, he was a 17th century British pastor, said this, God threatens terrible things to those who will not be happy. Psalm 2. Be happy or else. So Psalm 1 starts with blessing. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Psalm 2 ends with blessing. Blessed are those who, all those who take refuge in him. Psalm 1 started out with the way of the righteous, progressed to the way of the wicked. Psalm 2 starts out with the way of the wicked, progresses to the way of the righteous. Psalm 1 made it all seem easy and quick. The righteous are like a tree. The wicked are like chaff. They're just going to blow away. Psalm 2 makes it clear that the wicked sometimes have some staying power. They might be around a while, but not forever. If they will not be wise, if they will not kiss the sun, they will be broken in pieces. Psalms 1 and 2, taken together, form this wonderful introduction to the book as a whole. We read them as people who need comfort here and now, and we read them as people who are rightly longing for something more than just a better day. 
the psalmist tends to face east, waiting not only for the dawn of a new day, but for the dawn of a new age. Let's pray. Father God, your word is just amazing. Help us to be that man in Psalm 1 who meditates on it and finds delight and truth and life in it. And help us to be that man in Psalm 2 who doesn't live in the first stanza pointing out the people with blue hair, but lives in the fourth stanza calling people to worship a God who is so good and so kind and so patient that they can rejoice with trembling that they ever thought of rejecting him. Make us those people, Lord. Make us those people who in love, with tears, with kindness, can warn people, can give wisdom to people, and call people to worship the Son. Let them see in us a life firmly anchored in that fourth stanza. And maybe, just maybe, that day will become a day of salvation for them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. Would you stand with me?